Um, he'll come back. <laughs> All right, we're going to call this meeting back to order. <coughs> and <coughs> the next item on our agenda is the presentation of the 2017 Griffin Awards for Historic Preservation. And Jack Thompson, thank you for being with us. Thanks for being patient. Thanks for the soft chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Newman, County Commissioners. Uh, my name is Jack Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Preservation Society of Asheville and Buncombe County. Uh, honored to come to you tonight to let you know that uh, May is Preservation Month, and on May 25th, we had our Griffin Awards program over at the Historic Masonic Temple in downtown Asheville. And we are honored to uh, inform Buncombe County that y'all have won an award for your stewardship for number 205 College Street, also known as the Smith and Carrier Building. This is where your Register of Deeds is housed, sandwiched right between uh, a relatively new construction for the Court Center, uh, an elegant building for a new one, and a modernist construction on the other side. A little bit of history, in 1920, Albert Heath Carrier decided that his architect architecture business was going well enough that he should purchase an investment property in downtown Asheville. For the previous 15 years, Carrier had teamed up with Richard Sharp Smith, one of Asheville's most pro prolific and influential architects. Smith and Carrier were at the height of their careers when they decided to build a new office for themselves <coughs> at 205 College Street. Now let's fast forward to 1994. The county chose to purchase this historically significant building in the heart of the historic district of downtown Asheville. And over the past 23 years, the county has made significant repairs and breathed new life into the carrier building while the environments around it changed dramatically. The Buncombe County Register of Deeds is now a care the careful steward of this historic place and its history is celebrated in photography throughout the building. The Preservation Society is honored to award Buncombe County a Griffin Award for Historic Preservation for the good stewardship of the Smith and Carrier Office Buildings. Briefly, I have two more awards that I want to talk to you about because they, they fall under y'all's umbrella, umbrella, a little bit of uh, um, overlap here. Out in Sandy Mush, the, the Farm Heritage Trail was created in 2016 as a collaborative effort between Sandy Mush resident and farmer Terry Wells and Ariel Ziff of the Buncombe County Soil and Conservation District. The purpose of the Farm Trail commemorates preservation of agricultural land and lifeways. It creates public access to farms and goods. It educates visitors about agriculture, land conservation, and rural lifeways and it celebrates the rural landscape and supports cultural tourism in a remote corner of Buncombe County. The Farm Heritage Trail was awarded a Griffin in the education category this year. I've also noticed that the Sandy Mush Community Center has a line item on your budget, hopefully for consideration, that you may be a good steward of that historic property as well, out in our little piece of heaven in the county. There's an often published statement that quote unquote, Asheville was all boarded up in the 1980s. This was a misconception that the North Carolina collection at Pack Memorial Public Library wanted to dispel by taking a close look at just exactly what was going on at that time. <coughs> when did Asheville's renaissance begin? This six part series that attracted over a thousand people was also awarded a Griffin Award in the education category for 2017. And I know, I know Drew, our Register of Deeds, very well, and I'm certain that he's going to be very proud to have this hanging in 205 College Street. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much. <coughs> and I would, um, for folks who haven't been over to the new Register of Deeds, I just encourage folks to go over there. It really is, it's a beautiful historic building, and um, it's been, the, the reutilization of it as our new Register of Deeds has been done beautifully. Uh, I know that a lot of the folks in the Register of Deeds were very nervous when they were going to relocate, and uh, but it's turned out terrific, and I really want to commend uh, Dr. Green and her staff and the, the architects who worked on it and everyone who had a role in it, and of course, uh, our Register of Deeds as well in, 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 in working together. So it's a great project, and it's a beautiful, a beautiful asset for Buncombe County. So, and thank you for the recognition. We, we really appreciate it. 
All right. <coughs> um, next up on the uh, um, agenda is the uh, is an update from the Energy Innovation Task Force. Uh, we are not planning to have any vote on this this evening, but we'll have an update from the task force. And uh, Sam Rourke will be presenting um, along with um, some assists from Jason Walls and Brad Rouse, who are other active members on the task force. And um, Sam, thank you for being with us. And I know that you've got a presentation, too. And I think that'll magically appear on the screen uh, in the next few moments. There's the magic. <laughs> All right. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you this evening. Um, my name is Sam Rarkistis. I'm the executive director for the WNC Green Building Council. And I'm a resident with my family in Candler in the upper Hominy Valley area. And I'm also a member of the Energy Innovation Task Force. And uh, there's been so much time and energy put into this effort over the past year that I hope I do it justice tonight in providing this update and recommendations to you. Just a brief overview. The EITF, as we call it, um, was formed in April 2016 as a collaboration between the City of Asheville, Buncombe County, and uh, Duke Energy. There was a joint resolution to establish this EITF. It has two goals. Uh, the long-term goal is to transition the Duke Energy Progress West region to a cleaner, affordable, and smarter energy future rooted in community engagement and collaboration that is mutually beneficial to the community and Duke Energy. We also have a short-term goal, which is avoid or delay the construction of a 190 megawatt natural gas peaker plant planned for 2023. To achieve these goals, the EITF is creating a plan of prioritized strategies that members of the greater community, Duke Energy, and the City of Asheville and Buncombe County should undertake to increase the adoption of energy efficiency and clean energy in the region. So there's four convening entities. Um, the City of Asheville and the Buncombe County play the roles of serving as conduits to the community stakeholders, uh, contribute to the solution development and implementation of those in close collaboration with the community, and support community outreach and education. The role of Duke Energy is to provide data and, and con conduct analysis to create baseline and annual targets, support the analytical research needs for work groups, uh, contribute to the solution development and implementation in collaboration with the community, and also support the community education, outreach, and marketing. Uh, we have a, a nonprofit partner called Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, they are the entity that is leading the design, the facilitation of the overall process for the group. Um, they're also supporting us with analytical and research needs and uh, with strategy integration too. So uh, the EITF has a potential to be a national model for other communities and utilities. It's really, it's a unique um, thing that's happening right now. Um, it's a partnership like no other really in the country where the, the utility and local government and community and business partners are coming together to look at how do we um, essentially delay and avoid the need for a power plant. This is kind of a unique thing where a utility will actually ask the community to, for this support. Um, and it, we're also looking at how do we create an innovative clean energy solutions to meet the area's growing energy needs. So it offers a unique opportunity to create locally targeted clean energy strategies in collaboration with the utility to catalyze the community to reach a tangible, tangible goal. Because as you heard tonight, there's a lot of engaged, passionate people in this community that want to work on this. So we're working on with them. And to explore cost-effective win-win strategies and business models that align the customer, the developer, and the utility. Here on your screen is the representatives from the EITF. Um, there's a lot of brilliant, passionate people in here. There's been thousands of hours that have been dedicated to this effort so far. I personally have put in over 150 hours on this. Um, and also related to this, we have about 15 people that serve on the EITF, but there's also about 40 to 50 people that come to each meeting as well. And we have uh, subcommittees that focus on various issues too. So there's a ton of people engaged in this process and um, we've been able to collect a lot of their, their knowledge and information and passion in order to develop these recommendations we're presenting to you tonight. Um, on progress to date, so I'm going to turn it over now to Jason Walls with uh, Duke Energy to talk about Duke Energy's commitment uh, and what they've been able to, to formulate as part of this process. Thanks, Sam. And I'm Jason Walls, the district manager with um, Duke Energy Progress, and I'm going to go through these really quickly. One of the, one of the most significant um, 
work streams that the company has done to date is we're looking at how we're going to um, meet and honor our commitments to install um, at least 15 megawatts of, um, of solar energy here in the region as well as at least five megawatts of battery storage technology. We are getting really close to have identifying some of our initial sites for that battery storage technology um, that will um, likely exceed some of those those early figures that we um, talked about with five with at least five megawatts. So it's going to be a little bit more than that. And so in the in the coming weeks and months, we hope to be in a position where we can share really sp um, some specifics on where some of those will be located um, in the region. The idea is some of that. Um, is um, that investment will allow us to kind of push that power plant out a few years, even as we're getting started and we're working um, on this work. And a couple other things that we're working on, um, we're working to support the program's working group with um, greater alignment with um, our internal energy efficiency and demand side management team, um, as well as we are, um, we have engaged the services of the um, Shelton Group, which is a um, national leading uh, marketing and brand firm that focuses just on energy sustainability in the environment space to help us figure out how we connect with our communities to drive energy efficient behaviors. But most importantly, um, we have a, um, we have kind of renewed our commitment by putting an executive level person in charge of just the Western Carolina's modernization work, which the Energy Innovation Task Force encompasses. Many of you will remember a name, Robert Sipes. Robert was the regional vice president in charge of all company operations here for a number of years. Um, his passion and dedication to Asheville is unmatched um, in our company, and it's real exciting. It's real exciting. He's been here for the last couple of years as our general manager in charge of, um, of our poles and wires operation and our distribution operations, as well as the Western Carolina's modernization work. But now he is solely devoted and the vice president of um, the Western Carolina's modernization effort. And we're real excited that, that um, we have that type of leader to, um, to really align and bring people together inside of the company so to support this important work. Great. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so now we're going to go through the recommendations that the Energy Innovation Task Force has come up with. Um, just want to let you know that these recommendations have been you know, vetted and talked about for a long time. There's also the city is looking at these recommendations as well um, as part of their budget process. And then these recommendations are also going to be supported by the community collaborative entities like nonprofits and business leaders that are part of the Energy Innovation Task Force. Um, so the, the first one we have is for clean energy improvements for community organizations. So there's many nonprofit organizations such as homeless service providers, child care facilities and affordable housing entities and churches and volunteer fire districts that have their own facilities that we'd like to support. Some of these organizations are folks that have contracts with the county um, and they will be prioritized during the pilot phase. The, the funds would be primarily but not exclusively focused on energy efficiency upgrades that have a five year or less payback for those um, projects. And the good thing is by reducing utility costs, community organizations become more financially self-sufficient and they become less dependent on taxpayer funding or other outside donors. So this is a real uh, an investment in their facilities and uh, helping them reduce their energy cost. The second recommendation we have is to support expanded weatherization for low income households. So uh, high utility costs hurt low-income families the most. Um, helping low-income families improve the efficiency of their homes helps them save money while also achieving clean energy goals. And there's volunteer-based efforts such as the Energy Savers Network make a difference. And these models can really be scaled up to help more families and to achieve the broader energy goals. And I just want to turn over Brad Rouse with Energy Savers Network just for a few minutes to talk about uh, their program and how they're helping low-income families. <coughs> Yeah, uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, so we've heard a lot, a lot tonight about helping the poor, and we've heard a lot about people heavily involved in doing that. And we've also heard a lot of concern from the audience about the climate and the climate crisis. And I want to say that low-income energy efficiency, especially the volunteer-based program like where we're trying to get started with Energy Savers Network, is a, a way to do both of those with the same dollar. So you get you kill two birds with one stone. You help the poor. You help the goals of the EITF, and you help the in, um, the the um, uh, energy efficiency and and the climate. Um, the uh, a volunteer program I think makes a whole lot of sense. It just has so many uh, values. I mean, we have a tremendous, as you can see, a tremendous volunteer sort of um, uh, 
spirit in the community um, between manna and habitat. You have over 120,000 hours a year of volunteer effort focused on this problem of helping lower income people. And with, uh, you know, we're proposing a way to leverage that, a way to spring that. And so the funding would allow us to sort of build into that. So far, everything that that I've been doing now, working on 40 homes this year in Buncombe County is, is completely volunteer and completely donor-based. And so we can't really b get it at scale without more support than what we've got. Um, the, um, but the need, you know, the, the, the numbers of this are, are very profound. You know, I look, we look at, at, at efforts with when you're just looking at the cost of supplies, even a one-year payback. With, if you've costed out the volunteer work, maybe a, a three-year payback or two-year payback in terms of impact. And then those benefits keep going to the people that we serve for year after year after year. And it, but it's not just the money. It's just not just the numbers. It's the people. And, you know, so far, I mean, it's really, um, 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 there's just a huge need. I mean, um, working with um, a woman tomorrow in Asheville uh, who, uh, in her house, there's a number of problems we're going to try to work on, but the front door is falling off. And so that's an energy efficiency problem as well as a door problem. Um, we, we worked uh, in a mobile home in Arden not too long ago, and the, the resident there, a senior person, but she didn't, she didn't, she was a widow, she didn't know how her heat pump worked, and so the way she had it set, it was her own emergency heat way too much, and so we helped coach her on how to solve that problem. Um, there was an older man in Asheville, African-American man in Asheville that we worked with earlier on this year, and his heat duct was disconnected from his heating system in the basement at one critical point, and we were able to patch that together just using do-it-yourself volunteer labor. So we identified that problem, and we fixed it. It didn't cost much, but we had to be there. We had to have the organization, and we had to see it. Um, the, um, there was a man out in Sandy Mush that called us uh, called ABCCM, and they referred him to us, and he had a $900 utility bill, and he was going to try to get that paid for by one of these charities. Um, but, um, you know, he didn't know why he had it. We went out and we figured out the problem, and we recommended that he talk to some community action to really fix that problem of the $900 heating bill uh, for two months, for two months in the winter, uh, and it wasn't even that cold the winter. Um, and, um, you know, we, we worked with a woman in Emma a couple of weeks ago, a single mom, a uh, child at home, and she had some friends that moved the, the dryer from one place to another, and we did a lot of, on her house. We, fi we, pi we fixed windows. We insulated part of the attic. We did a lot of work there, but, uh, y you know, she, the, the, her friends had moved her dryer to a different part of the room, and then we, we said, well, let's find the dryer vent, and we looked around and found two, found two dryer vents, and so we said, well, where, where, which one is the real one and which one is the not the real one? Then we realized that behind the little board, there was a hole in the wall from the old dryer vent, which is a source of energy infiltration, and so we repaired that for her. And that's the kind of thing that, with a low-income in program, volunteer base, that we can do. And so I just wanted to share some of that with the, with, with the members and, and say I think we've got a, a, some good, good proposals here. So. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, there's a, um, you know, many families in this community that receive federal dollars through the state and through the county to help with home heating assistance, and many of those dollars, you know, are paid, and then, you know, if they're not energy efficient homes, then that, that basically that money leaks right out their windows. Number three um, is to encourage greater use of energy efficiency practices in new construction. Um, you know, we're rapidly growing as a county, and we, you know, we cannot mandate utilization of green building practices strongly than North County Building Code here, but we can encourage them. And so we're uh, requesting the county should offer incentives and permitting processes for more energy efficiency in construction and help educate the building community about uh, not only Duke Energy's financial incentives, but also other community types of programs that could help residents be able to solve their problems. And the fourth recommendation is to explore expanded energy efficiency and renewable options for public facilities. Um, the EITF supports your efforts to um, current energy efficiency improvements for facilities and also the proposed solar farm on the retired county landfill um, and in, in recognition of the increasingly cost-effective renewable technologies we also encourage the county to explore expanded installations of renewable energy systems on public properties and facilities including schools and throughout the community and how do we pay for this well we have a, um, a suggestion to create a Buncombe County Clean Energy Fund um, to provide resources to advance these energy goals um, and, and basically to avoid the need for a power plant and to transition Buncombe County to a clean energy future. 
The fund will basically leverage uh, utility incentives that are available and provide energy audits for local businesses and organizations, and then help um, do the energy efficiency improvements for low-income families and community organizations. And uh, it also could be, this fund could be also be used for researching models for expanded energy efficiency and renewable energy in Buncombe County as well. Um, here are the budget recommendations that we have. Um, the volunteer-based low-income resident, residential weatherization program, um, about $35,000 for that. Um, we would also be hoping to get funds from other sources as well to leverage that money. Um, there's a re request for $50,000 to support RMI and their facilitation efforts. The city's also chipping in um, that much money to support this process. Um, we're not asking for any money right now for a community engagement, but um, that's based on the recommendations of the Shelton Group. Um, $25,000 to encourage green building through the permit process. This also includes education for the community and staff. Um, community energy audits, $50,000 to pay for the cost of the audits to the community organizations. And then the, the clean energy fund would be $400,000. And then this is really the, the bulk of the money to help pay for these energy efficiency improvements for low income families and for community organizations. Um, and it would also help to you know, support the staff for residential low income. Um, programs like community action opportunities and research additional energy efficiency and renewable energy opportunities for Buncombe County as well. Um, with this, basically this is an investment in the economy and in the community and in the environment. Um, these, the money that you'll spend will, will multiply many fold to help support these organizations and these families um, and also to help delay and avoid that peaker plant that we so desperately need to do. So um, that is pretty much our recommendations and we greatly appreciate this opportunity to, to speak with you today. Great. Thanks, Sam and Jason and Brad. So um, <coughs> thanks for the update and um, any questions at this time? We've got a lot of other presentations on uh, budget related matters that the county manager will present later but uh, any questions at this time thank you so much this is for all the incredible work and the presentation um were the priority areas that you listed ranked in order of uh or have you all ranked the priorities we haven't ranked the priorities no okay these are just uh, essentially all recommendations that we feel are necessary to okay. meet all our goals okay thank can you. you can you bring the previous slide back up I'm not sure maybe, that's maybe not, but that's capacity. A, I mean, that's okay if you can't bring it up. Uh, so my question is uh, similar to uh, uh, Commissioner um, Flora's question. Um, you know, m my concerns are reaching those who are struggling. Uh, I share the, um, the, 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 the vision of those that are out there that are struggling with their heating and power bills. Not 100% sure that this is the answer. It could be part of it. I know that Duke Power over years, and I don't know what you know you do, do now, but it has had uh, assistance programs for people upgrading to heat pumps and 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 such as that. And that need is that need is great. Uh, there needs to be more research, in my opinion, uh, associated with that part. It can return uh, uh, a lot of money uh, personally to the to the families that are that are having four hundred dollar power bills and five hundred dollar power bills and six hundred dollar power bills in homes that are eleven hundred square feet or less, and uh, that would be my uh, challenge. Uh, and there's a lot of homes uh, like that in Buncombe County. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are some are older stick built. Some are you know older manufactured homes. Um, both have uh, that $400 a month, you cut it to 100 with a new heat pump or something like that, which can be done, you're talking about a major, major impact. Again, I'm not sure that this is the way to go about it, but that's where um, the need is great. For me, um, you know, we approved and I, I supported the LED lights in the schools. I think it was a great thing to do. It was part of the, part of the solution. If that school had a, had a horrible problem with its power bill uh, and, you know, the, the source of its heating and the windows and so on, it would have been um, not a wise decision for me to load it up with LED lights if I didn't address those other things. So, 
So that's kind of where my mind is going with uh, the people that live out in Sandy Mush and some of the other places that uh, may be, uh, and, other, and everywhere across the county, not just there. I said that because you, you, you mentioned them, but uh, that is putting a lot of strain on the, on the power systems in some smaller homes. So uh, that's kind of where my thought went when I looked at your list and where my priorities you know, might be, and I would challenge you to, uh, to look at that and that needs to be part of the solution, um, uh, I think, so. <clears throat> Thank you, any other comments at this, at this time? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I look at this in two different forms. We have tons of people in the county right now, including the county that are helping people with their properties to get them up to try to help with energy. Duke Power brought this forward and set up a task force to try to help with a, a plant. <clears throat> now we're talking about half a million dollars of the taxpayer's money. Well, how am I gonna tell the taxpayer that's in my age or maybe a little older that lives in a home that goes down here to the tax office after we have to go up on their property tax to cover this for whoever you want to cover it for or to think you want to cover it for because you don't have a plan, you just have an idea. And they're having to make payments on their property tax. 2,500 of them are. I see the Sierra Club's got 5,000 people, as she says, part of the Sierra Club. Well, to come up with that kind of money, you just need $100 from each one of them. So this ought to be, it's not the county's responsibility to back up Duke Energy. Duke Energy has a project that they thought about doing, and they asked a few people to come into it. That's good. I think it's very well. But I don't think that we should be the ones that's a culprit that has to stand up the city and the county for something that we don't know if it's going to work or not work we're all sitting under lights right now if it wasn't for gas and coal right now we wouldn't be sitting under lights and we're not going to be sitting under lights if you think it's all going to be solar or energies or batteries or whatever batteries in cars go bad it costs money to get rid of them Solar panels are going to go bad sooner or later, and it's going to cost a ton of money to get rid of them. Power plants are going to go bad, and it's cost a ton of money to get rid of them. So me personally, I think you need to go back and research what y'all would like to do as a group of people, not as coming to us and telling us what we need to do. We're up here to supposedly lead. We're not up here to supposedly follow. And I look at seven people up there that need to be leading. and. I don't need to be following any group of any sort. I work for 253,000 people in this county, and there's definitely not that many people in this room. But I'm working for the ones that physically cannot afford to pay their property tax all the time. They've been here all their life. We keep going up on them. And as I said, there's over 2,500 elderly people that are having to go in the tax office and make payments on their property tax and their homes are paid for. So I'm totally against this. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll just make one brief comment. Um, so I you know, appreciate you guys being here. I, you know, of course, I've been representing uh, the county on the board uh, as well. And um, it, I just would just reiterate that this is a, a part of the reason I wanted some other folks to update tonight is because I kind of feel like you guys kind of hear me talking about this stuff all the time. I'm probably sick of hearing it from me. So, but as we, as we hear from these folks and some of the other people who are with us tonight, there's, there's just really strong support in the community for, for I think, making this, um, trying, to, trying to make a difference in this area. And I think part of what I like about the recommendations that have emerged that are being recommended back to the county is that <coughs> they're making recommendations to us to try to address some things that we're really already involved in. You know, we're all, like, we, we heard from a lot of great organizations tonight about their organizations and programs and things they're doing. All these different organizations, all, they all work out of some building somewhere, and they all have to pay a power bill every month, and, and, and they get direct taxpayer funding from us to carry out their mission. So, 
you know, just like the, um, you know, the LED project in the schools, you know, great environmental project, great carbon footprint project, um, but it's gonna, sa it's gonna save the county school system a million dollars a year, you know, and has a three and a half year payback. I mean, so we'd be financially foolish to not take advantage of those kind of opportunities on our own public buildings. But for these other organizations that are receiving direct taxpayer funding, you know, we'd also be foolish not to help them um, lower their utility cost, just like we are with the schools, because then they're gonna be more financially self-sufficient, less reliant on us. And, um, and you know, in this community, um, in terms of the low-income folks uh, and, and their homes, we spend $2 million a year of taxpayer money to provide heating assistance to poor people in Buncombe County, mostly in the wintertime, so that they don't fr literally freeze during the coldest days of winter. And because we believe people should not be miserable just because they're poor. It's true most of that money is, it is mostly state and federal funding that passes through us, but it's still taxpayer money nonetheless. So in the same way, I think there's, there's really strong financial arguments for us trying to make a difference here, um, as well as um, uh, great opportunities uh, on the clean energy goals. So thank you guys for the update. That's all I've got for now. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to chime in and um, beyond ex expressing my appreciation, <coughs> um, pick up on some of what you said, Brownie. I'm very supportive of this and appreciative of the task force recommendations. I think the challenge that uh, I and my colleagues face is, is balancing this with other pressing priorities and a tax rate that we're trying to keep as low as we can. But it, it's it's very exciting to see this list of priorities enumerated and to see the vision behind it. And um, I'm ex I, I am fully supportive of us moving forward with this plan and um, figuring out a timeline around which we could do that, um, given some of the budgetary constraints we have. But just applaud what you all are doing and the vision behind it and the <coughs> compassion. Um, and you know, be, um, in addition to the financial arguments for this, I think I know as a person of the faith community, I know there's incredible strong support from faith communities across Buncombe County to be engaging on these issues. Um, and um, just uh, appreciate what you all are doing. Thanks. I too support what you're doing, but I'd like to ask a question. Do uh, organizations like Helpmate and other organizations who are working uh, to help people with, well, not Helpmate, Habitat, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. who work to help with, you know, repair houses and to make them energy efficient, are they represented at the table on this task force? There are nonprofits. Habitat hasn't been participating at the task force, and we have had a conversation with them to try to get them to start doing energy efficiency upgrades because that's not really their focus so much. And But um, they have, you know, we have been in conversation with them and Mountain Housing Opportunities as well. Community Action Opportunities is the main nonprofit entity that does a lot of the, you know, work in the community, mm -hmm. and they are on the task force. Um, and we have also had meetings with like Evelyn Charities and other groups that um, have a direct connection with uh, families that need support. And there's a long list of families that need, you know, need this kind of support that we already know that are waiting for it. Um, and we have been inviting and, and basically touching base with as many nonprofits as possible that, that are in service to the community. So let me ch let me chime back in real quick on the again I, I want to challenge uh, the your the the goal question is and prioritization is a is a really really big deal. There's a lot of you mentioned Evelyn. There's there's a lot of people like Evelyn and others that you make a phone call to them, you know, and they're going to try to make sure that person's heat's taken care of and and. Um, so there's going to need to be a lot of thought around mm -hmm. around this. Right. Um, yep, and, and there's a lot know. of great models that already exist in the country, and I've worked on other energy efficiency programs. So we, we kind of know what the model can be. We just have to need the resources and the time and energy to, to make it happen. Yeah. And I, I would also just uh, just add, you know, I really encourage them. We have a lot on the agenda tonight. We've got to keep this pretty focused. These The program's working group of this task force has done an incredible amount of research. They could, they could give us a two-hour version <coughs> of what we've just heard. This is not the, um, this is not the product of it. This is a, this is a very high-level overview of much more detailed analysis and kind of program <coughs> ideas that they've, um, one more they've thing. done some great work on. Yes, sir. Yeah, they've done their work, but we have one person sitting in this room back here. His name's Greg Israel. 
he's been working for a long time on the county, making sure that we save energy and, and help the carbon footprint and bringing it down. And he, you know, why are we trying to tell the county more of what they need to do when people come in here from, <coughs> I was on the board here, and I think he might have been Brownie, when people had basically, Dave against said people came in here from Charlotte to tell us how we could save stuff, energy. <coughs> and they told them they learned from him. So, you know, we don't need a whole parcel of people telling us what we need to do. I have a house that's 27 years old and it's energy efficient. It was a long time ago and it still is today. Still got the same heat pumps in it. And when you have a light bill that's under $300, I think you're doing pretty good. And it's 3,800 square feet with three heat pumps. So it goes back to the same thing. We are in here trying to decide that we put a little task force together that's supposedly going to be able to do something, but we're not sure exactly because nobody knows the true effort of it. It is, we can save, we can save lights by turning them off. That's no big deal. But I can't see the county as, as we have to go forward tonight with a budget, getting ready for next week, how we're going to be able to accomplish what we're trying to do here and be able to do that too for the people. We got to work for the people. We don't, you know, there may be a few people in the county that like it. Sure, I like it, but that don't mean that I have to say that, okay, I'm in love with it. That's that's the facts, Mr. Newman. We'll the take, facts are we'll take like people, it. Here, <laughs> people, people here know how to save energy. And we that. don't need to tell our people in the county what they need to do, especially working here that saved for many years. Uh, Mr. Presley, give a comment. <clears throat> Yeah, I just want to echo Commissioner Belcher there. Is I think it's great, but we, and for the last two weeks, this budget has been very, very tough. And with tax increase, and we're trying to work on it, I, I've got to agree that right now I think we need to put it on hold right now and investigate it more. Hey, we got you. Turn her. Uh, Hold on. Yeah. Hang on. Let me turn you on. <laughs> now you on. Oh, great! I couldn't um, quite hear. Is there a list of prioritization um, with this so that um, the first priority, or you know, maybe it wouldn't have to be done. You know, could be done in two years instead of one year. I'm just trying to think of. I didn't hear the answer to that question. Yeah, they, there's a presentation that we just um, they just walked through, Ellen. So that'll and that'll be on the county's website. So we can you can look at that. And there's a list of uh, the, the breakout of the uh, the funding, and um, and Sam mentioned earlier there's not a specific like it's not ranked from top priority to lowest priority. It's just these are these are the recommendations. So um, that's that's where we're at. That's what's been presented tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, I just didn't hear when um, Jasmine asked that question. I didn't hear the answer. Sure. But I saw the breakout. Yeah, that was good. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, no problem. Well, and I know it's late, but you know, my and so my suggestions is that that prioritization be very clear and more detailed than what we had what we saw tonight. So that that would be very helpful as we try to look at this and 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 make you know good clear decisions. So I'm done. All right. Thanks everyone for your comments. Thanks for being here tonight, guys. Yeah. All right. The next item on the, the agenda is the public hearing for the zoning ordinance text amendments. And Debbie Trumpy will present the amendment. The, the very patient Debbie Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the proposed amendments to the text of the zoning ordinance that you're hearing tonight are to encourage conservation subdivisions to add standards for impound lots and tow yards and to correct a reference uh, to general statutes. Specifically, the following changes are proposed. Definitions for conservation development subdivision and motor vehicles impoundment lot or tow yard are added, and the definition of junkyard is amended to exclude impoundment lots. The statutory vested rights provision section is revised just to correct a reference to North Carolina general statute. Um, the permitted use table is modified to add conservation development subdivisions and to add 
uh, motor vehicle impoundment lots or tow yard. Uh, the dimensional requirements section is modified to add conservation <coughs> development subdivisions <coughs> to the type of development that are allowed a reduction in minimum lot size and setbacks. The steep slope high elevation overlay permitted use table is modified to add conservation development subdivisions. Steep slope high elevation overlay district lot size standards are modified to allow the reduction of minimum lot size for conservation development subdivisions and a new section titled uses by right subject to special requirements motor vehicle impoundment lots or tow yards is established uh, is added to establish standards for impound lots and tow yards it would require that motor, ve motor vehicle storage areas be enclosed by a security fence and then a row of buffer uh, evergreen uh, trees be planted on the outside of that fence. The planning department recommends approval of the proposed amendments as they are consistent with the comprehensive land use plan. The 2013 update recommends the establishment of land use regulations which allow for a flexible range of development options and the expansion of land use policies and regulations to adjust for changes in land use patterns and demands. The planning board held a public hearing on these proposed zoning ordinance amendments on April 17th of this year and there was no public comment. The planning board found that the amendments are <coughs> consistent with the land use plan, reasonable and in the public interest, and recommends approval in a vote of seven, um, nine to zero. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have for me at this time. All right. Um, we need to do a public hearing on this. Let's open the public hearing at 817. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on the proposed text amendment? All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing at 8.18. Uh, are there any questions or a motion on the text amendment? Make a motion that uh, we approve and find that the request is consistent with the county comprehensive plan and use plan reasonable in the public interest. I second the motion. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. We got you. We got you. All right. Uh, <laughs> The next item is a public hearing on the Land Development Subdivision Ordinance Chapter 70 Amendments. The pro proposed amendment to the text of the Land Development and Subdivision Ordinance is uh, simply to ensure that hillside cluster development lots are adequate for a typical home and wastewater system. Uh, the following addition is proposed to the section on hillside development standards cluster development. <laughs> Cluster developments that utilize septic systems for wastewater treatment shall include as part of their soils investigation report required by section 7040 the conclusion that the amount of disturbance allowed on each individual lot is adequate for at a minimum a three bedroom septic system and the construction of a 1500 square foot single family home. Planning board held a public <coughs> hearing on this amendment on April 17th as well and there was no public comment and the planning board recommended approval in a vote of nine to zero thank you i will open the public hearing on the proposed text amendment at 819 are there any members of the public who would like to comment mr yelton question for the board and you won't answer you can't because it's a technical question but I think you need to consider what I'm saying as you pass these ordinances I remember a long time ago people talked about how that you were going to end up having to make decisions on individual lots if somebody's not happy with what happens in the planning and zoning so the bottom line is are you going to do an overlay of your rules and regulations and that impact on property values. I think you need to think about what I'm saying. Because when you start saying, okay, one house and it's gotta be this size and so forth, you are impacting the value of that lot. Especially if it's a community where all the houses are 1,500. So you know, you're gonna to have to look at the neighboring lots and create an overlay on your taxes 
that will reflect that. And I would like to put that through to you as a suggestion for somebody on this board to push for that because I think it's very, very important. Because I have a situation right now where uh, Charter is refusing to even tell me what it would cost to run a cable line to my house. I can't get anybody at Charter. That's impacting the value of my rental house. Because anybody today that wants to do high speed internet work, and so these type of things you're going to have to start considering in your overlay for your taxes, okay? Just wanted to pass that along to you, and I'd like to have that recorded in the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, close the public hearing at 821. Is there, uh, are there questions or a motion on the amendment? I have a question or just a comment. Could you just, for the record, explain what a cluster development is for the public since uh, it's in there? Cluster development is where um, there are smaller lots so that more of the, uh, the parent tract can be set aside as open space. So the intent of this is not to require everyone to have a 1,500 square foot home, but there are density bonuses for um, things like reduced disturbance on the, um, in the tract. So what we're doing is try to ensure that the developer in his eagerness to get density bonuses actually <coughs> does provide a, a lot that's viable and it could have a typical home with a uh, three bedroom wastewater treatment. Okay, thanks. All right. So I'd like, like to make a motion. So I'll make a motion since I have the language here in front of me. I uh, find that the, make a motion to approve, find that the request is consistent with the county comprehensive land use plan, reasonable and in the public interest. Second. There's a motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Ms. Trumpy. Thank you. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is the public hearing on the FY18 county budget, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Wanda Green. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, want to just give a, a brief overview of where we are and uh, where we started the process. Um, but I want to take just a moment. I've had the privilege today of having uh, lunch with the Fire Firefighters Association and with management team this morning. And um, maybe it's just a reflective time, but I looked around the room and I, I really feel very blessed to be associated with such dedicated public servants. And I think our citizens are very fortunate that we have people who really want to serve them so well. Yeah, and so for that, I'm very grateful. Um, just to revisit for a moment where we were in May. We brought you a, a budget of $419,289,000, which was a $7.2 million increase in the general fund budget. These are the main numbers, and we have continued to work on these, on these, uh, this budget. Um, it is a reval year. In 2017, we had a 60.4 cent tax rate. Revenue neutral calculates at 51.3 cents. The budget that I brought you was, was developed using a 55.9 cent tax rate. I will say, I've heard very clearly we need to bring that rate on down, and we continue to work at doing that, and thank you for each of, uh, each of you working with me as we've tried to do that. Um, just to visit, if you look at our revenues, um, <coughs> the percentages on them are pretty consistent, with property tax being our largest revenue source, uh, followed by intergovernmental revenue and sales tax. If you look at our spending plan, um, the, the larger expenditures are education, public safety, and human services. Those are, that's consistent from year to year. There are core services. The things that we do have included in the budget, uh, we will be finishing our Cox Avenue facility and the parking deck there, have to pick up the debt service on that. We've got some state requirements related to NC FAST and retirement increases for our employee and just utilities for our parking deck. Uh, we do have some cap debt service for capital. <coughs> no, we took that one out, excuse me. We are still, let me back this up a little bit. We are still looking at um, some expenses related to public safety, economic development, energy and court requests, and trying to determine what kind of changes we need to make in our budget. And our budget at this time will will in, uh, increase for some of those. We, have, we also received our request from the city schools, county schools, and AB Tech, and that represents requests that are up by uh, $7.2 million, 
We are working with those agencies and we'll be meeting with them to, to determine what we actually can do with our budget there. The other thing I would point out is we do set several tax rates and that includes our fire districts and our city school tax. Um, most of those are uh, asking to hold their rate and if you look they're very and I think they have visited with most of you in your district. We do look forward to hearing from the public tonight uh, to get their thoughts and their um, advice and feedback on the budget as it was presented and ha and hopefully this helps them know there's still things we're having to consider. We will be back two weeks from tonight and have to adopt a budget. Several things that we do hope to have come to some kind of closure is the state budget. Uh, that'll help us look at our education budgets and uh, right now there's there's a few things happening but um, we will wait for the House and the Senate to get together and come back with a budget that we can see how take a really close look at how it impacts us. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have and looking forward to hearing from the public. All right, thank you very much. Um, So why don't, we, um, why don't we open the public hearing? There's been a lot of comments on the budget during the opening public comment. Um, but I'm gonna open the public hearing on the FY18 county budget. Uh, after we take any additional public comment, then we'll bring it back to the commission. All right, I'm gonna open the public hearing at 827. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment this evening? Yes, sir, please come up. <coughs> and then Mr. Yelton, did you raise your hand? Okay, you'll be next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commission, for your patience tonight, giving us the opportunity to speak. I'm Tracy Elliott. I live in uh, beautiful Shiloh, and I'm the Executive Director of the Asheville Humane Society. I'm here for two reasons tonight. One is to thank you and your predecessors and the county staff for an amazing 27-year partnership between Asheville Humane Society and the Buncombe County Animal Shelter. I'm also here to ask that you um, take care that the proposal that we put in front of you, thank you very much for your open-minded reception of that proposal, is fully funded. We're not able to tell from the budget documents available to us whether or not that is the case. Um, it appears that it is not, but we would hope that you would, um, would seek that answer for us. Um, as you know, this partnership in the last 27 years has achieved amazing things. <laughs> we now save the lives of every single adoptable animal who comes into the county shelter. That goal was set by this commission in 2006, and we met the goal two years early. That, another way to put that is our euthanasia rate for healthy and rehabil rehabilitatable animals in Buckingham County is zero. At an international conference in Toronto just last week, Ashley Humane Society and the Buncombe County Animal Shelter were named one of the top 30 of the 5,000 <coughs> animal shelters in the United States. Just last week, also, the um, Executive Vice President of the ASPCA said that our community outreach program, which we talked to you about when we met with you, is one of the top five in the country. In 2016, we assisted 9,250 animals. 4,100 of those were in low-income families in low-income neighborhoods that we are working in, such as Emma and Deaverview. Our first targeted neighborhood was Emma. We assisted over 900 families in that neighborhood in the first 12 months. One of our strongest partners there is uh, Jeremy Stowe, the principal of Emma Elementary. He told us and said publicly at one of our events that the best moment a child of his or one of his students may have in his day or her day is when they go home and they greet their animal and get the unconditional love and the stable love that an animal provides in a family. We're very pleased to be doing that. These particular programs are funded by private funds, but we um, leverage every public dollar that we get from you by about $2.20. Plus, we also bring in $1 million, $1 million of labor equivalency cost um, that is donated by our huge volunteer force. We also supplement basic shelter services by about $200,000 a year. As an example, we purchased a $40,000 transport vehicle um, to have 1,000 animals leave the shelter every year and go to northern shelters. We cannot continue to do this. We need our basic um, shelter services funded by you, if that is all possible. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration, and thank you for this partnership. Thank you.
Well, I've got positive news for you all at this point in time. How about that? You can solve all the problems in the world. You can take care of all the energy problems. You can take care of all the animal control problems. You can take care of all of the problems of putting people to work, insulating houses, and everything if you put the money behind it. The only problem is, where does that money come from? So I'd like to propose some solutions. I think there's some solutions that are unhidden. You know, they're hidden here and you don't look at them. I've heard a lot tonight about coordination. I know this county has a contract with United Way for over $100,000 to refer people to where they can get help. Well, very obviously, based on what we have heard tonight with all these help agencies giving help, United Way is doing a lousy job. You're getting a bad deal on your $100,000 over there. Now, the other thing is, as you look at this, these nonprofits are supposed to be nonprofit. I can start a nonprofit if you'll give me enough money to fund it, and then I can pay me a salary out of it. So you are creating jobs when you do that, but that money comes from somebody else. So why don't you put these things under an umbrella? Look at it. Now you can't do that this year, Brownie. It's going to be too hard. But look at putting them under an umbrella to where people in the county that's having a hard time paying their electric bill can go donate time and get some credit for it. If they're going to get $200,000 in heat credit, how many of them can work in some of these agencies and let them receive a reward for their effort? We all know you feel better when you work for it rather than get it given to you. And the reason I say that is I ran an ad for somebody to do some work on my farm. Out of four people that I interviewed, three said, you pay me under the table and I'll work for you. And I laughed at him. I said, I'm already paying your $1,000 a month food stamps and your rent subsidy. So no, I'm not going to let you get cash and pay you under the table because I need the tax write-off too because I'm trying to have affordable renting. And so to keep my taxes down, I think you need to look creatively at some of these solutions that are outside the box that you're not going to hear from the agencies that want the money and you're not going to hear it from your staff. And because you're sitting up there considering who you're going to hurt with each vote, you may not even think of them. So release those chains on your brain and figure out how you would do it if it was your $419 million, okay? Thank you. Mr. Rice, and you'll be next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. You ain't wore me out yet. We can still go to midnight if you like. Well, you, your budget's increased 10% a year for the last 10 years. Got to repeat it. Sometimes you're old and can't remember, so I'm going to repeat it. That's a lot of money. Budget jumped from $24 million in two years. I believe the $24 million jump was an intentional effect on the tax rate for the upcoming 2017 reevaluation. I believe this board should unanimously make sure that you preserve the integrity and the taxpayer money and vote unanimously. I can't even say that. All of you then, okay? For a 50 cent tax rate. Go down if you have to, even more. I believe there was an inflated appeal loss added into the budget. Just uh, remind you commissioners, there's $12 million sitting over to school board in a fund balance that you have control of, and you ought to take priority in it using it for the tax rate. If the kids are leaving Buncombe County School, my God, get the money and use it for us taxpayers. You have a $75 million fund balance. Now keep, keep adding these numbers I'm giving you. 
we're having a hearing today on the 2018 budget <laughs> it's amazing we ain't got all the budget yet I don't know what comments I might be able to make after you give me all of it I thought you told me Brownie that you're gonna let me get all that when you got it you ain't got it yet we're having a public hearing today the taxpayers need some relief did you hear that now we've heard a lot of give me give me give me we <clears> hear it every word every year but I'm going to give you an old song to remember as we leave here tonight. She got the gold mine and I got the shaft. <laughs> Did you hear that? You just sing that old song and you'll understand what it means when you get screwed. The taxpayer just got screwed if you don't vote unanimously to bring it down to 50 cents. I'm not taking that back. You need to listen to it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, come on up, please. Hi, my name is Roy Harrison. A few minutes ago, a few Maybe an hour ago, I was honored as a senior champion. And I think I've followed those two fellows before. <laughs> and they've been around a while, but what I'm here to, to, and I don't know all the budget numbers that you're talking about tonight, but I do have a concern. And the concern I have is that I'm retired. Having worked 40 some years in engineering and technician type jobs here, and 30 of them, 34 of them here in Buncombe County. I may be one of the few people that paid a mortgage off. But now, as it comes before me now, and I'm like, okay, am I gonna stay in Buncombe County? That is one of the questions I'm starting to ask myself. One of them is, can I afford to stay in Buncombe County? As I look at the rest of my career, if I say this is one third of my career, is, you know, two thirds is gone and the next third is, and so now I'm walking and I'm listening. I decided I was going to leave after the, the award, but then I said, you better stay around. We're going to be talking about your life and how you're going to be affected and how it all affects me. I love Buncombe County. Been here all these years, raised a family. They both, my two children <clears> went <throat> to the public school system in Asheville City School. And in turn, they're now on to their careers in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Charlotte, North Carolina. But now they, they call me, and they're starting to wonder, are you going to stay there, Daddy, or are you going to leave? And so these budget considerations you all during the night, they have a great effect on me personally, and they have an effect on people of my age, and they have an effect on people of color, and people, everybody, it, they have an effect. So as we go forward, I guess I'm gonna be watching it a lot better now. And I apologize for not being here for the last five years to see what was going on. I appreciate your service over the years. And I appreciate everybody that has come before you to spell out their hearts, because that's what they're doing. I know there's a lot of requests for money, but what I am so much requesting from you is a quality of life. That's what I'm looking for as I continue to be in Buncombe County and the city of Asheville. Help me with maintaining a quality of life so that I could maybe one day, oh, by the way, the blanket that I have back there, I'm trying to decide now whether to put it on the right side of the Hyde County blanket or the left side. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect timing. Well done. Um, all right. Anybody else who'd like to uh, speak during the hearing? All right. We'll close the public hearing on the budget at 840, and I'll bring it back for a discussion at the commission. We're not going to vote on the budget tonight. That's what we're going to do in two weeks from tonight. But are there any, any questions or um, for the county manager at this time? Yeah, I, I've got 
I've got one. Could you explain the uh, um, the the fund balance the fund balance that was mentioned, the seventy five million dollar fund balance? Explain the um, appropriated fund balance. I think the only thing we have to go by right now is at fifty five point nine, uh -huh. and then what how much fifteen percent is because I think that's the recommend recommendation. Correct. It is. You could it, elaborate on that a little bit. Tim, do you mind if I ask you to, to explain this? What's the available out of the 70 uh, some million yeah so the so yes there is like i think 73 million dollars of fund balance but uh, a large portion of that is actually restricted for other obligations um, and so what is available what we consider the available fund balance for that 15 percent is actually i think 53 million dollars and that is uh what we have is considered assigned committed and unassigned and so that is what we consider as our reserves which by the LGC requires or would like us to have 8%, but by the board policy, uh, you set the policy at 15%, and it is currently at 17.4%. And the fund balance that we have appropriated is in this budget that we have before you at 55.9 is um, $12.5 million. So I guess my question is of 15%, so what the, is the, that the 15 what is that yeah, so the dollar 15, number? Yeah, yeah, so the 15% 15 is 15% 15 of the of the budget of the actuals from the prior year. Give me a dollar. Approximately. Uh 15% would be about 49 million. Mm -hmm. 49 million is what we have to have. That by your policy, yes, you need to keep that much. Okay, thank you. Right. Other questions? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, we talked about it in the planning session. When will we get a copy of the total budget so I that we'll have time to review it before we look at uh, vote on it? Uh, the day after the uh, budget message, the first Tuesday in May, we place that on your dashboard. Uh, if you need some help accessing that, we can help you access that tomorrow. And it's all the line items in all the departments, and we're happy to help you access that. But it's on your dashboard. Um, now, will it be on there after we make the final cut, so to speak, after we decide on the nonprofits? That's what I mean. Everything. Uh, it will be on the dashboard. Yes, sir. We'll have to make adjustments to what's there because right. what we brought in is what was recommended, and we've, we've continued to have a lot of discussions about right. line items. But, yes, it... Uh, when do we plan to have the final budget there? That's my question. Well, I, I need a little more time with each of you to come up with a tax rate that's tolerable uh, for everybody and still meets the need and protects the fund balance and looks, looks uh, forward at least to two to three budgets. So we, but I also will tell you, we have to post the budget next Tuesday. Uh, so we are at, at the end of our, our time frame uh, by Monday. That's what I was saying. Okay. Mr. Green? Yes, sir. When will we have the total budget ordinance? Somehow we missed it last year. Uh, the budget ordinance get, gets posted next Tuesday, which will be on the web on Wednesday. This, which Wednesday? Wednesday of next week. Okay. And we had a discussion on the gun range on the computer and I'm still a little lost there as far as we're buying things with money that was produced to the gun range and uh, uh, how did how did this proceed to happen when you borrow money uh, you tell the bond the people who buy your bonds how you will use that money so you use it for the purpose and should so in that particular case it's a public safety purpose should you have any money left there's only two things you can do with money left over use it for a like public safety purpose or use it to pay the debt when we started this budget process we needed two million dollars for ambulances and we were able to repurpose that to buy what was left to buy your ambulances we replace those every four years uh, if you if you choose to use it for debt service instead we would just change that in the budget so the so that you see ambulances and a lowering of debt service there's not another option uh, to do that with I mean you can't but, <clears throat> if you save money you can only use it for those two purposes but it wasn't brought before us to talk about these ambulances or vehicles that in that amount of money that was talked about that that we spent that's where you know i got lost in the picture you know you, you try to figure stuff out and it takes a little while and i'm not that smart and i know it, you got time that you have to spend on stuff but uh, 
being surprised that we buy X amount of ambulances, and it, it was a pretty big number. Uh, and, you know, anyway, you want to look at it, and two point, over $2 million and a million eight hundred thousand in, in ambulances alone uh, at, at one time. And I don't know of any county commissioner that knew that this was happening. We have historically replaced our ambulances every four years. Uh, there's a long track record of that. Uh, I'm sorry if we if we didn't give you all the detail you needed in that budget amendment, but um, we, you know, we go out for bed every four years. We try to save money where we can, but ambulances get to end of life. And well, I, I, I just heard that it, it was put out on a thing that we basically used to money and it was on April the 27th of this year. And I thought we had a, a deal that our county manager would work with us and tell us what was going on. And after X amount of dollars, she had to come before us to be able to spend this money. Actually, um, it, it was a budget ordinance. I'll pull that out and show it to you uh, if it's a, uh, and, and we did talk about putting amounts above a certain level on new business as opposed to uh, old business. I'll have to go back and look at the ordinance, uh, at the budget ordinance, but that would be my mistake if it didn't uh, show up on new business, but it would have been in consent. I've never seen it on anything. I'm sorry. It, it wasn't in, on all the two lists that I had for a budget period. I've, I've never seen that. No. I'm, that's the one thing I'm just disappointed that you know it's it's hard to find stuff and then when you find it it's uh, it's a little disappointing I, I apologize for being that way but you have done a great job and I know we all sometimes do things including myself that uh, we have to look back at but uh, as as who we are as a commission seven of us we should know exactly what's happening when there's that kind of dollar spent period you know it's it's not just ambulances it's it's vehicles and we do have vehicles tied into this budget for the sheriff's office but you have vehicles tied into that too so you know uh, or that's what you said so it's you it's that, it's yes. basically mm -hmm. you know I don't know how we're doubling down on vehicles but it's hard to realize that something that come in as reasonable as the gun range that we owe as much as we do so thank you thank you All right. Are there other questions from commissioners? Yeah. Go for it. Dr. Green, appreciate 20 years. Thank you. I only got to spend six months with you so <laughs> far, and it's been great. Thank you. But uh, I like Jerry Rice's 50 cent thing. I just wish we could get there. <laughs> and I know you wish we could. I wish we and could too. You show so much passionate, and here you are leaving, but you're still very concerned with what's going on. Uh, I know uh, most of the commissioners know my big concern is what we're going to do with the elderly people. You know, when they was making $3 an hour and now it seems like $12 an hour and a lot of them own their property but they don't actually own it because they're making payments every year and some of them are paying more than what they paid for that property in the 30s and 40s. So, you know, that's it. But I think one thing that can help us all is, me and you talked a little bit, if you could explain that we're trying to get it where we can get it down closer to revenue neutral. We're not going to get there. I, well, I hope we do. But you're not, you, I think you mentioned you're not concerned with 2018 as much, and here you are going to be gone of what 2019 can bring. Um, we, I, that is how I feel. I think that when you look at 2018, I, I don't believe we can lower it to, to revenue neutral. I just don't see a way we can get there and fund all the requests that we have that are a lot related around core services. We are continuing to look at places where we can reduce our expenditures, and y'all are, are instrumental in helping us get there. Um, and we will we'll continue to look at those numbers. I th I th in some of our conversations, one of the things that's a challenge, especially with our elderly population, there is an, ex uh, an elderly exemption on property tax if your income is below, I think it's $29,000. I do think there's a good opportunity that we could go work with the General Assembly to get them to raise that level. Now, it raises it across the entire state, and, and we have to, because uh, 
property taxes treated equal across the state of North Carolina. But I think if we took our like our average median income or took a, a look at something that's much closer to what it takes to live here and went to the General Assembly and said, can we raise the elderly exemption income limit to whether it's 34, 35 or wh whatever it is, it would start to help a lot of people uh, and give them that uh, property tax exemption. Uh, so it's uh, it's have not seen any action on it, although we have made the inquiry about it in this long session, but I do think it's something we can go back and talk to them about in short session because it is a budgetary impact item, and I believe that we, we could have that discussion with them and see what we could get, to, get them to do, which would help our elderly population a lot. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Excuse me one second. On that, I think the veterans already get more than the people that's on Social Security. They do. You know, I'm a vet and I am on Social Security. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, I think the people, just like the gentleman spoke in the back, you know, you retire and he wants to stay here. Mm -hmm. That's 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 basically what I, I'm saying. I want people to be able to, too. So if we can talk them into forty nine, fifty thousand dollars to get it close to the veteran side, uh, then people can afford to stay here. And that's good a, point, a really good point of reference to start with. If we're doing, I want to say it's 45 for vets, and I'm not positive about that, but if we took it and said, can we do that for people who are right now at 65 and older, um, I mean, that would be a good starting point. We will need involvement, your involvement with the General Assembly, our local delegation, to have that discussion with them. And we're happy to put the research together and show them some options. But I do think it's time to take a look. When it started, it was like at 25000 It's been a lot of years ago. The, the growth factor on that's very small, so we're really only at like 29000 now. And I believe it's been eight or ten years since we got that exemption. But happy to put that together so we can talk to the local delegation. And I appreciate you being involved in that conversation, which has already started, you know, with uh, at the Senate level and so, some other things. That, it, this, this puts us in a, you know, we've, you know, we have new commissioners and, you know, being here a fifth year does not make this any easier. Um, there are those that have come here tonight that are passionate about certain things and should be. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that those things will be funded mm -hmm. at the level or within the time that they're requested because uh, the need is great but the requests are just year after year increasing um, multiplying it's it's amazing and I think that comes from the public's willingness to serve and to help and to be involved and so they reach out in their community and then they when we open the door each year for community grants and other things they reach out to us too so I get that that's part of it um, I think as commissioners we have to make uh, the difficult decision and say where we are comfortable at with the tax rate which the easy answer is the lowest possible tax rate that we can get but in order to you know to challenge the department heads or Dr. Green, we have to say, you know, if I'm comfortable in the 53-ish range, you know, um, because maybe we can't get to 50 or 51 with uh, with the mandates and with uh, with other things that that have to be done. And when the when the public safety comes in here and requests additional funds to to do their best to keep our children and grandchildren safe. I mean, how do you, you have to dis, you have to very carefully and cautiously examine those numbers because um, that's, a, that's very near and dear to everybody's heart in here, making sure that your kids are safe, your grandkids are safe, and everybody's taken care of. When poor communities, whether they be in, uh, in Candler or Leicester, or whether they be in Shiloh or where, wherever they are, when those community people come in here and passionately ask for their families and their friends, uh, we have to listen to that. We may not be able to fund all that. We have to recognize the need and, and hopefully within our departments, we go there first and challenge them to do a really, really good job and improve that, those areas and help more people there. And then you go to the people that are working outside of 
you know, the county services, HHS and wherever, and try to help them. This is a difficult year. The easy thing for us to set up here is if the tax rate comes in too high for me, and may say no. Just vote against it. That's easy. That's easy. The hard thing to do is to challenge each other in conversations and say, that's why I ask about fund balance. What's a safe amount for us to be able to bring it down as low as possible? And uh, we're discussing that and looking at that and challenging each other with that. So, um, so that's all, you know, that's really all I've got to say tonight. I, I'm, I'm grateful to all the people that come in. We're going to have additional time to, to, to th thank Dr. Green, and I've done that privately myself, and just a wonderful job in the, the time that I've been able to be here to confide in her and others um, and, and be helpful in, in making these decisions. And I, I appreciate everybody that's come here tonight and said things. Those that work for the county, those that don't work for the county, you know, Jerry Rice, others, people come in here very passionately and open their hearts up to us, and that's a really big deal. And, and uh, we were talking, we were talking out back that we, usually when it's budget message, there's not a whole lot of people come in. Mm -hmm. it, it's blown my mind. You know, we're in here talking about a $400 million budget, and not many people show up. And people showed up and showed out tonight, you know, in, in, in giving us advice, and I, I appreciate that. And, uh, um, I think I'll hush. Okay. Okay. All right. Is it late? No, it's early. It's not late. Okay. Uh, no, no All right. Other comments or, or questions at this time? All right. I, I'll just make a couple. Um, thank you to Dr. Green and all the staff who work on our budget. Um, I, um, I guess I would just, I would just say that, um, I, I share Commissioner um, Belcher's comments. There's, we've got some, we've got some, um, and the, the other comments as well that have been made. We've got some very tough decisions to make over the next two weeks. Um, we want to support um, the core services of the county. We want to support the core priorities that we hear from the community. We all have to run for office, and we hear people talk about things that they want the county to make a difference in. And so, and, and there's things that we can do to make a difference. So we want to. Uh, we want to address them. We do have a lot of a lot of great partners, a lot of great community organizations that we work with that that um, make a huge impact. We need to make decisions on on that. Um, public safety is always going to be a priority, um, and and we're going to be focused on that. The, the the proposal from the school system, of course, that's always going to be. Um, you know, receiving our, our highest consideration as well. So we've got. But we do want to lower the tax rate. I think we're. I think we're. I think there's all seven members agree that we would like to lower the tax rate below the the 55.9 rate that was um, proposed in the in the uh, earlier drafts of the budget. The question is, how much more can we go while still doing the things we want to do? And I think we got to think about not just this year, but we really need to think about um, the next several years. And I think we, um, cause really just 12 months is just sort of almost like a snapshot for the county. We need to, we need to look into the future. And I think we should, we should try to set a tax rate, um, that is as low as we can go, but which is sustainable, which is going to preserve Buncombe County's, uh, AAA credit rating, um, which is, um, which is not a given, you know, there's not many communities around the state that have that and it. Um, it doesn't just sound good. It saves taxpayers a lot of money. Uh, when we when we do these capital projects, so we I think we've got to we've got to protect the AAA credit rating, um, and um, and I, I would say I, I I would agree I don't think getting to revenue neutral um, is probably realistic in this cycle as much as I would love for us to do that. Um, I think the you know the uh, I mean the new the new um, health and human services building on Cox Avenue alone I mean that's a forty seven million dollar project that this body approved. And that, that project alone is $4.7 million of annual debt service we need to make. That project alone makes getting to revenue neutral, um, you know, probably not realistic. But I think we do have room to lower this. And I think we're all going to have to make some concessions on some of the issues we care about. Uh, I will be prepared to do that on some of the projects and areas that um, I've advocated for in the budget. And um, so anyway, those are a few of my thoughts. 
and, um, and I'm sure we'll get to a good place at the end of the process. So thank you to everyone who's come out tonight to share your views and, and participate in uh, this really important uh, decision for how to use taxpayers, your, your money. Um, anything else before we move on? Yeah, just to echo the thanks we've heard about the passion people have shared and sharing your time at the end of a long, busy day. And um, just sort of want to put out some of the sort of guide stars for me in making this decision. Um, the driver will be knowing that there are people in our community who are hurting right now, and there's areas where we have to act. Um, and also knowing that there are places where if we act, we can make a real difference and help people um, live into their full potential. Uh, and balancing that with needing to be um, as vigilant as we can about lowering the tax rate, uh, knowing that um, that has a real impact on people, especially folks living on limited incomes, uh, folks who are elderly and retired, um, but that we have to, we can't be, um, uh, we, we can't do that to, in a way that's reckless when we think about next year and the year after that and the year after that. So there's no formula for how to thread the needle on those priorities, but I'm um, very appreciative of the dialogue happening between the seven of us and county staff uh, and Dr. Green's leadership in helping us try to find an answer that um, addresses, uh, you know, ad addresses the task before us. Thank you. All right. All right. I think we're got, uh, I think we're, we're done with this for the evening, but to be continued. And we've got a couple of other items to, um, to take care of this evening. So let's move on. The next item on our agenda is the uh, resolution establishing the method of interfund borrowing for solid waste capital expenditures. And of course, only Tim Flora could probably uh, Explain be asked that. to take on that, that topic. So course. I will try to be quick. <laughs> um, so oh gosh. Chairman Newman, commissioners, tonight I bring to you three actions for the solid waste program. Solid waste also being known as the landfill. Um, just as a reminder, the enterprise solid waste is an enterprise fund which mean it means it is self-sufficient, so it is paid for solely by user fees. Um, the three actions before you, one is to approve a project ordinance, which is a capital project to expand and update the county's transfer station of 35 years. And then the other two items are related to the funding of that project. Uh, so I will, um, I can, we can talk about the project if you want to talk about the project. Uh, pretty much it's just an upgrade, update of the, 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 land, the transfer station, which has been there for several years. Uh, so it's, it's worn out. It's time to be replaced and refreshed. Um, and uh, what we would like to do is, because at our board retreat, we talked about one of the reserve funds we have, what we would like to do is self-fund that out of one of our reserve funds, which basically is using the $16 million pot of money that we have uh, setting aside to pay for the closure post closure cost to close a landfill. Uh, we would like to use, we'd like to borrow from that fund and then pay our, ourselves back over the course of the years. Uh, and that is what the resolution is about that you have uh, on the agenda, which is basically a resolution which uh, sort of sets the parameters for us to borrow those funds. Basically what we want to say is as we have, uh, uh, depending upon the capacity of the landfill, uh, we are able to borrow a certain amount of money from, from the reserve fund. Um, basically what it is, it, it, what it's, uh, uh, this resolution is sort of also creating a policy moving forward to make sure that when we do borrow from that reserve fund that it is only going to be for solid waste projects and only specific projects um, and that we will always protect the the integrity of that reserve fund so basically how it works is we've got a landfill right now that uh, when we built it, it it sort of has a capacity of 30 years well uh, because of the innovative processes that we have at the landfill it, it is really has a capacity now of 40 years. So we know we're not going to need some of those, that, those funds for 40 years down the road. So therefore, we think we can borrow those funds to um, pay for this project and make sure uh, that we have it paid back uh, by the time that we, we would actually need those funds. OK, question. Um, so the, the money is there for us to borrow from. Yes. And the amount is how much? Uh, $8.2 million is what we're asking for the project ordinance. Okay. So, and that is on the capital plan, too. So, yes. when that shows up on the capital plan, you know, I'm thinking, you know, property taxes. I'm thinking no. 
that type of debt. So that gives me a little bit of a little bit of help in looking at the capital plan and, and hearing this. So and so this basically says that we will that 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 process is acceptable to the commissioners. We approve that process. Yes. But if we do it in the future, you have it, you have to come back and we have to approve that amount too. All we're doing is establishing a process. So no, we no, we're actually here tonight. There, there are actually three. We, we, you have three um, documents, three actions tonight. One of them will be approving the project ordinance, which is the right, right. which is the project ordinance creating the project, the $8.2 million project to the transfer right. station. Then we've got a budget amendment, which is basically moving the money from the reserve fund over to the capital projects fund. Right. And then the other is the actual resolution itself, which is saying this is how we're going to, moving forward, this is the policy that we have created for how we're going to use these funds to ensure right. the integrity of that, that reserve fund. So I got all that, but so my, my question was if we use it again in the future, then you have we have to approve that yes amount. yes okay yes yes absolutely yes okay and, and in the resolution um, those funds can only be used for solid waste projects Got it. Uh, they they have to come before the board um, and there is a sort of a formula inside that resolution which says we can only borrow as the capacity of the landfill um, as the, the landfill fills up we can only borrow less and less of those reserve funds right okay is there public comment? Uh, we will have public comment once there's a motion made. Uh, so how many motions do you have to have? I probably make one motion to approve all three. I'm going to make one motion to approve all three. Just me. There's a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. Uh, let's open it up to public comment on the motion. Yes, sir. Mr. Yelton. I don't have to talk what is your projected payback rate? I understand what you're doing. You've got the, the money is set aside from the enterprise fund because the landfill has that much extra money in it because you're trying to have the post closure. Cover. So th this would be set up just like a regular financing. Okay, it would be 20 what's years. What's your projection for pay it back? 20 years. 20 years. Well, it depends on what we're funding. If it, if it, hey, Tim, uh, Tim, speaking to the uh, speaking of the mic. Yeah. If it is a, if it is a, if it is a building type, it would be 20 years. If we're going to buy. Uh, equipment from that fund, it would be like five years. So you, you've not decided yet on the project what you're going to do? Yeah, well, this, this is just for, just for the transfer station. Okay. And, and so, that, so this, is, this will be 20 years, yes. But in the, but, but in the, the resolution itself, it, it, it gives the guidelines for how yeah, we would I, use I, it. I read that, and I saw that, and I was trying to figure out what the payback would be for this eight Yeah, it, it'll, be, it'll be 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. And so one of the, other, one of the benefits from this is that we don't have then those outside uh, debt service charges. So it, and That's we right. would be char charging an interest rate on that debt, and the, the, the landfill would be, or solid waste would be paying back that loan on an annual basis, so. So the key is then not to increase what we put in the landfill. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, well, uh, any other? your capacity, so. You know, any other comments? All right, um, is motion on the table? Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the next item on the agenda is a resolution regarding expansion of the use of the Article 46 1% sales tax. And Dr. Green will present the resolution. Please. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, when we pass Article 46 sales tax, the Board of Commissioners passed a resolution restricting that the use of that fund or dedicating the use of that fund to AB Tech construction. We are asking you tonight to amend that resolution and help us um, expand the use of that for AB Tech, and we would expand it to use uh, to pay for both operations and major maintenance based on the final approval by this board for every project that, I mean, for all the expenditures that are brought forward. I'll talk to Dr. King about it. He's very supportive of, of this expansion moving forward, and um, we're just asking you that you give us and our, give the county and the the college both the ability to look at this in a broader way okay. all right thank you uh, are there questions or a motion I've got some a question okay. uh, well it's not a question I'd like to have an add to it um, there's a lot of things on it that I was totally against we have used money for major maintenance already in the project mm -hmm. 
Major maintenance, I've been over there and I'm part of the board. I can see that. Uh, the one thing that I'd like to add and to it is the Board of Commissioners encourages AB Tech to use former General Service Director Greg Israel to oversee construction. And evaluate every facility to determine the major maintenance issues at the college. He has full control. The college needs to actually pay him, and I would like to see that in a three-year contract, Mr. Israel. Um, so I'd, I'd make a comment on that, um, Commissioner Fryer. So I think that. Um, I think I'm in agreement with you about what you're talking about. I think we, you know, one of the things that we, um, as we've been looking at the AB Tech campus, uh, I think we've all real, realized, and I think AB Tech has as well, that they need to really, we need a great, we need to really get a high quality assessment of all the buildings there. So we make sure we're taking care of the buildings that are there. Right. So I'm in, a, I'm in agreement with you. Um, just from a procedural standpoint, I kind of feel like that's almost kind of like a separate item. This, you know, this sales tax thing is it's kind of a long-term policy. I, so I guess I'd kind of like to suggest we do what you're suggesting, but we do it. I don't know if it makes sense to attach it to this sales tax, you know, um, policy that we're well, talking about. The only, here. Thing, so, only thing I'm saying there, Brownie, yep. is in the sales tax. The sales tax will be paying Mr. Israel out of the quarter cent sales tax. To, for the three-year period to try to make this work. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I don't, maybe there's no re reason that it couldn't be done. It just seems like these are sort of apples and oranges kind of kind of uh, things. But I'm in agreement with what you're suggesting. So, um, so you. I can't hear. <laughs> Could we get that? Could you want to repeat that, please? Repeat it, Alan. I didn't bring you up. Yeah. If, if we can vote on that separately, but have it on um, on the agenda for the 20th, a contractual agreement with Greg to oversee um, the maintenance and future construction needs. Because I'm, I'm supportive of that, too. I, I like the recommendation that let's let's take this, let's put, I think this is going to be a consensus item to encourage AB Tech to do a full assessment of all the buildings, make sure we're taking care of them. I think Greg, would, if he's willing to do this, would be a great person to do it. I think we all know that. Let's put it on the, let's put it on probably the consent agenda at our next meeting to take care of this suggestion. Can you, um, can you accept that? Sure. Great. Okay. We'll, we'll Very have good. that ready on the consent agenda. Um, any other, um, any other discussion or is there a motion on the? Uh, I, I, mean, I just have a comment. I think that the, this uh, this addition for major maintenance long term will protect the investment that the that the the sales tax was set up for in the first place. And right. so I uh, uh, I'm happy to make a make a motion to uh, to approve it. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. Thank you, Mr. Presley. Motion to second. Further discussion. We will open this up for public comment, so uh, we'll do that now. What was voted on was the tax increase for construction, so now we're changing that tax. Uh, and I question the validity of that. Furthermore, I think you should have a time limit on this, that it comes back before this commission, because I'm reminded of something Jerry Rice said many, 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 many years ago. He said, you're building all these schools, but you're forgetting something. You build a building, you're going to have to maintain it. So where's all the help going to come for maintaining it? And I think in the interest of sustainability and self-sufficiency, doesn't AB Tech have courses in maintenance and repair? Don't they have courses in anything like that? If they don't, maybe they should be looking at starting a course. Do they have a course in how to clean a bathroom? How many of you folks have gone into bathrooms lately and looked at the floor and the tiles? We're using foreign labor in most of those jobs and they don't know what clean is. The grout in the tile is filthy. So maybe they ought to start a course 
in housekeeping and maintenance. Would that not be beneficial with all these apartment buildings we're building and all these hotels and motels we're building? So I think you need to, in your own personal relationship with that board, Mike, if you're still on the board, I don't know. And I think you as commissioners should start pushing for AB Tech to do that because they should be providing this service while they're training students to do it so that since we are going to be a tourist mecca, we're going to have to have a lot of laborers. And you know, nobody wants to do that work. And when nobody wants to do it, guess what? You start paying more and more and more. And you need to go out and talk to some of these hotel and motel operators and ask them what they would pay to have a real smart, sharp maintenance man and good cleaning crews that would keep their hotel and motel room spotless. I guarantee you would find you wouldn't have a problem getting $12 an hour or $15 an hour, and probably $25 and $30 an hour for that if they produce. So I would like to see something other than just passing this and letting this, 20, this quarter of a percent go on forever and ever and ever, funding, not construction, because that is a violation of the resolution that was passed and what we voted on as citizens. And I will be watching that and check the legality of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I've not heard anyone bring up the amount of money tonight related to how much money that we voted on, how much we've spent on the buildings, and how much we got left, and is that what we're talking about using to do whatever? Where's this money coming from? Is this new money, or is this the bond money that we voted on? That's the bond money? Now, Mr. Fry, I thought you said that we'd already overspent that money. Close. Well, how close are we? Okay. We're, we're honestly not there yet. Okay. My, my point here is if we're not there yet, we, the public here don't know how much that is, but here you're voting on a resolution to do something and add stuff to it, and we don't know what you're talking about. It'd be good to know what you're talking about before you bring it up to vote on it. You certainly ain't educating us back here. So... Before you vote on it, how about giving the public a chance to understand what you're doing? You're into smart people, but I can't tell that if you don't talk. Okay? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. May I speak? Yes, sir. The way I was looking at this is we have went and looked at buildings. Mr. Pres Mr. Presley and myself went over there and looked at some stuff the other day that needs fixed. If we don't fix it, then that means another building. And I agree, Don, and I agree both of you, it's very much so, that the problem is we have a college that you wouldn't believe there's things that's happened at, over at that college that needs to be taken care of. We build new buildings, we tire buildings down. There's buildings that need to be tore down, and the people want new buildings. We're, and we're close on money, but the one, th one way I looked at this picture, the money that we borrow, uh, Dr. Green, has an, isn't it like a 20-year deal on the yes, 46 sir. deal? But the way I was going to look at it probably next week or the week after uh, in the process is we have money that's going in. It's all Article 46 money. And if we can do these projects without going and borrowing money, that's what I'd like to see tried to be done and still make our 20-year debt deal because it's going to be around and you can't overdo the debt and the money's going to build up in, in that fund. So if we can even save enough money to say to put, they want a building, we can, we can do a building. But it, I want to, honestly want to try to get it as pay as you go. That's what I'd like to see and, and where we're at too. But the main thing is we have to get somebody that has some control of this particular. I think it's got me off. <laughs> <laughs> she has a button on these, right? <laughs> that's all right. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that's that's where I'm at, and I, and we still do have some money, you know. We got, 
basically 20 some million dollars that we can see but there's a, there's a lot of stuff and if we put the right person in place that can save us money like he did the top floor over here uh, through his maintenance people there was four million uh, if we went outside and he did it for a million three so uh, he's creative in the way that he gets stuff done and that's that's why my suggestion is put him in place so that we can save every nickel we can save and you know and I think the job would be well done so so just real quick and I th we got a motion on the floor yep okay yep. Um, just real quick for the, the for the sake of clarity for those out there you know part of this says that the Board of Commissioners have asked AB Tech Community uh, College Board of Trustees to evaluate and needs each structure on the campus and provide a comprehensive facility plan recognizing that such plan will take several months to prepare etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, I, I want to thank the board for their stewardship in in looking at this and and making sure that we meet the needs of AB Tech and that we meet it in a, in a very practical way and because we have noticed there was concerns regarding major maintenance this takes that off the table allows it to be able to be be fixed and not coming to us every year asking for X number of dollars to to do that it's it's just a very clear way and there's a it's it's spelled out very very well in here so uh, but I have one question dr. green how much money do we have um, I don't have that spreadsheet in front of me we had we committed to spend and my uh, commissioner Fry would know this better than maybe in the fourth whereas we talk about all the things that we have spent the money on so right. far so it's very clear yeah. where we spent the money it generates um, about 12 million dollars a year uh, and when it was passed it was passed as a yes or no are you for the tax the way you determined what you would spend it on was this resolution we're asking you to address tonight um, and we are having discussions about what are the needs but we also need to know the state of the facilities I think we're still several I mean many million dollars short of having spent what the original list said and prices have gone up since then but um, it does clarify very clearly in the the fourth whereas how we spent the money so far and we do track that and we were to uh, want to do another building or something that came up we would come back to you with a clear path that says how you can uh, uh, pay for that with that fund did that answer your question thank you all right great so we've got a motion and a second um, any other questions let's, let's vote uh, all in favor please say aye. Aye. aye aye any opposed all right thank you very much dr green all right the final item under new business is a resolution to issue an rfp on the solar project on the retired county landfill so um i guess i'll just make a couple of remarks and i'll ask john if you would like to uh, share any additional details on this so uh, we had the solar project on the county commission agenda at the last meeting and um you know and some questions and concerns were raised about you know the process that we're using and um uh and there was support expressed for making sure there's an opportunity for any company that would want to put a proposal in front of us for this uh, project would have an opportunity to do so so that's basically uh, what this RFP would do so um, this would invite any any company that has an interest in partnering with the county on this to send us their qualifications and experience and um, and talk about the approach they would take to working with the county on this project basically with the approach that as we've described all along that we're looking for a partner to basically handle the development process as well as the financial costs of that as well as then actually installing and operating the system so that's what we're asking folks to do and uh john would you like to add any comments uh to that yeah i mean i think you've covered it I mean, obviously we're looking for we need a study to determine how many acres they're going to use uh the megawatts that will be generated and the substation down at MSD it has a capacity and okay so that will limit whatever the size of that the output of the solar farm is and then it's it's like the chairman said I mean we're looking for qualifications I mean years of experience in doing this have you ever done one on a landfill have you ever done a, a solar farm in in North Carolina or gone to the Utilities Commission here and the people that that are in charge of that firm you know what's their experience and who's going to be working on our project just like we would 
for an architect or an, a, an engineer. So uh, I think that's that's kind of the direction that we're heading. And you know, obviously we we're looking at their their financing, their debt capacity, those kind of things. So, so is Duke Power going to still be a partner in this discussion? And uh, it, sorry. So is Duke Power still going to be a partner in this discussion if we don't like the RFPs that come back? You know, is that going to, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to go back to where we were before? So we'll open this up to public comment in a minute. And Jason, okay. if you'd like to add or, or correct anything I say. But I think what Duke has said to us is that they encourage the county to do this because they want everyone to feel good about the process. I think the commission's unanimously supported the idea, but we all want to feel good about how we get to the, to the, uh, to the, the project being done. So Duke is encouraging us to do this, and, but has also said that the proposal they have put forward to the county that proposal still stands still and they would they're prepared to uh okay. to act on that and if we do continue to uh if we, if we ultimately decide to uh, move forward with duke as our as our partner good thank you i'd like to put a motion on the floor to approve the issuance of the solar rfp second there's a motion and a second um we will we're going to vote on this so i'll go ahead and open it up for any public comment Oh, you're fine, man. That's good. Especially since I talked about South Carolina last time you brought it up. I want to congratulate you and Duke, too, for doing a resolution asking for people to put a proposal in. Uh, the only question I would have is how long are you going to have that uh, proposal out and how are you going to recruit people to, to bid on it? Because I don't think anybody can probably touch Duke on this deal because they've already probably looked at it and know it's viable, but, you know, to, so that the public feels good, at least get somebody else to submit one, and then you can compare apples to apples, and if they don't spell out what Duke does in their detailed proposal about some of the questions that I asked in the paperwork that I handed you, what, how long is it going to last, what are you going to do when you have to tear the panels down, how are you going to maintain the condition of the grass at the landfill those type of questions should be considered in your proposal and you probably don't want it but I'd be more than glad to help you evaluate the proposal if there's any questions that you fail to miss because I do have a background in environmental systems engineering and I meant what I said about that billboard put there so low on the ground they can't mow underneath it and have to use a weed eater with a man bent over so Common sense sometimes replaces an engineer, and Robert, you know that. You can design a car with a book, but you have to make final touches when you get in that sucker and start driving it, don't you? Thank you very much. Glad to see you do this this way. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Me and old Don, it don't cost you nothing to get advice from us. You know, we're good consultants, you know. Um, my, my concern here is all of a sudden here come Duke in, the big boys, you know. I think Brownie brought them in. And uh, uh, it pro this big project come up. Didn't have a clue on your mind what the heck was going on till it was you know till we started asking questions back here and then you started digging my concern is is this the only thing that you, you even thinking about putting on this landfill or even projected out to people and say are there anything else out there that might be more viable money wise to me, I, I don't understand just throwing this one project out there with that many acres of land. <clears throat> and, you know, if you can put a ball field at Inca out there on a landfill, what in the name of God can't you do that? And it brings in a lot more revenue than what you're talking about with Duke. Is that right, Joe? Yes. You got it. Now, Joe grunted, but yes. It brings in a lot more revenue because it's done been projected out at Inca, and that's a little old place out there compared to what you got down there. Now think about it. Are you really doing it for the best use of that land? You got it. Jason. I'm gonna walk slowly. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jason, well, I can't sit here this long and not just get up and, and just kind of confirm or, or affirm that um, the chairman is correct. That you know, what, in the letter, I hope all of you um, were able to read the letter that that we um, shared a few days after the last meeting, where at the last meeting we were coming with an expectation of celebrating and excitement, and we quickly realized that there were still some questions that folks had about the process and how we had gotten there. The company um, was not brought in by the chairman. We actually submitted an unsolicited bid because we saw an opportunity to be a partner with a community that we care about, and so we uh, submitted us an unsolicited bid. Um, in this process and as things started to unfold we realized that the smart and the right thing to do is to continue to encourage um, each other to kind of take a step back to submit a, an RFP to actually have people respond to that so that we can all if we do decide to work together in partnership celebrate that investment and that partnership in the community together and so um, what we've offered and, ha and what we've offered in, for, in terms of partnership is still good um, but if you get a, a, a better deal that you feel that is in the better interest of the, the, the citizens in which you represent me being one of them as a resident of Buncombe County then, um, then please go forward. But our our offer and what we have um, offered the county is still good after this process. Great. Thanks very much. Any other questions or discussion? No, I'd just like to thank Jason for stepping up and doing this. And I guess we, as a, a board, need to try to pick a amount of time that we want to put it out. It's, uh, the, it's uh, on there. It's uh, um, August. August. We're asking uh, yeah. for information to be sent in by August 1st. Did you hear that, Don? August 1st, deadline. All right. Uh, we've got a motion and a second on the table. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jason, for staying through all four and a half hours of this meeting so far. And, uh, and we, got a we are through with the uh, new business items. Uh, we have a vacancy on the planning board. We've got one vacancy and there's four applicants um we have we have advert this is for the this is for the reynolds district um position on the board we've uh, uh filled this in the, in the last couple of years um and now there's another vacancy what's the uh any comments on this vacancy set up interviews for before the next meeting but i'd close the applications process since we've got four okay yeah, so we we'll, four. we'll we'll interview these four um and we'll plan on doing that before the next meeting June 20th. do in addition to the um well okay that sounds that sounds good we'll do that all right um the next meeting of the buncombe county commission is on june 20th at 5 p.m uh at 326 room 326 200 college street in downtown Asheville. we do have a closed session this evening i'm aware that we're going to be uh, potentially addressing three different topics one is an economic development um, project the second is a personnel consideration that is related to the search process looking for the county a new county manager and the third is a regarding um, a legal item so those are the three items so those are the three topics or reasons for going into closed session is there a motion from a commissioner to go into closed session so moved second. right there's a motion in a second to go into closed session we expect to reconvene this evening but to take no action uh, on any of these items tonight yeah, maybe So we'll leave it at that. That's based on what we know today, <laughs> right, right at this moment. Right at this we'll, moment. we'll go, we'll go uh, from there. All right, so um, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All right, uh, we're going into closed session. We'll be back. <laughs>